Uh, thank you. So um, I, I basically lead a, a business research institute. So I'd like to talk about uh, complexity economics at the level of the firm. Um, you know, what's going on? Uh, what new thinking do we need? And so on. And uh, this will be informed by uh, a major quantitative study we did on um, resilience, the dynamic performance of companies, all public companies across 50 years. Um, some collaborative work we did with uh, Simon Levin, an earlier speaker, on the principles of uh, resilient systems, and also may work on a, a new paradigm for dynamic uh, strategy for a complex uh, context. Um, so we haven't really defined our terms um, in terms of uh, what does complexity uh, mean, but um, I mean, one measure of uh, complexity is Kolmogorov complexity, the, the number of words it takes to describe uh, an environment. And I think the, the number of words on the slide is indeed uh, great. If we, if, we, if we try to answer the question, what's going on? Um, we have to talk a lot about uh, dynamism, which is uh, the, the speed of movement towards new states um, and the number of states in any period of time. And we have to talk about the multiple dimensions of, uh, of uncertainty, which is the multiplicity of future states that a firm needs to, uh, to contemplate, uh, which is far in excess of any sort of classical uh, scenario planning exercise, uh, just you know, six factorial um, times two would not be feasible for, for an exercise, and this is a simplification. Um, and also, um, we have to do that um, in the presence of uh, increasing numbers of resource constraints in terms of uh, labor and aging economies, uh, natural uh, limits, uh, and also now an elevated uh, cost of, of, of capital. So I think um, indisputably we're in a, a more complex environment. And I think the key, uh, from a strategist, a business strategist perspective, uh, the key trend here is, is the one in the first box, which is the fade rate. Um, so if you look at the, the excess returns of, of companies in an industry above the industry mean, and you look at their regression to the mean and the speed of that across 50 years, you can see a a very systematic um, uh, acceleration, which means essentially that the renewal rate, the metabolism rate, or the innovation rate of a firm uh, needs to increase. So the question I want to address is, um, how can we be more uh, option-based, more dynamic in our strategies um, under conditions of, uh, of, of high constraint? Um, so resilience is, another, is a more popular word for describing this. Um, uh, all CEOs were talking about the word resilience during the COVID crisis. Um, uh, much uh, very familiar, but I think much misunderstood, largely unmeasured, and and not systematically managed. And so, um, let's start with the definition. My um, operational definition of resilience is the ability the ability to anticipate shock, to absorb uh, impact, to adapt to recover critical functionality, and to thrive under new circumstances. And uh, I define it that way um, because uh, for a number of reasons. One, it um, it, it, it makes it measurable. Um, so if we look at this uh, cartoon, um, which is very similar to the actual data of public companies, um, of a resilient company versus non-resilient company in the face of a shock, some companies anticipate, not predict, but anticipate the possibility of. Um, some, some don't. Um, some have a, a big drawdown in performance when the shock hits. Uh, some are more buffered. They've in, invested in buffer stocks or, or cash buffers. Um, they adapt to the unfolding reality. Of course, in a crisis, in retrospect, we give it a simple name, the COVID crisis, but any crisis as it progresses, progressively reveals itself, and therefore we're constantly adapting to new information about a crisis, and that uh, the slope of the adaptation curve, the recovery curve in performance, is uh, very different between companies. Uh, and then, of course, um, well, not of course, I mean, we often assume that a, a crisis is essentially cyclical. It's a cyclical deviation uh, from a uh, a previous state that is returned to. And in fact, looking at 50 years of uh, volatile periods in business across different industries across the world, we find that actually uh, the pattern of demand almost never returns to its former state. Uh, there's a new reality that has to be adapted to and, uh, and reimagined. Um, so the, the, the value of resilience um, is, the, or the competitive value of resilience is the area between uh, the two curves. And that's something we can measure and we and we have measured and parameterized. Um, and um, so I'd like to talk about some, some learnings from this uh, analysis. And the first learning I think is already um, conceptually derivable just from the, the shape of this curve, which is that actually resilience is not one capability. It consists of a, a number of 
uh, distinct capabilities. One of the is the capability of anticipation. Another one is the capability of uh, absorption. Another one is the capability of adaptation. And uh, perhaps uh, it's a shock uh, to see the words resilience and imagination juxtaposed. But essentially, um, in the later stages of a crisis, we have to reimagine a company under under new conditions. And we certainly saw that in the in the case studies that we looked at. Um, We've surveyed what do managers think resilience is, uh, and then we've contrasted that with the data, and we find that it's very misunderstood. Um, so typically, uh, uh, it's, it's believed by large companies that uh, uh, resilience is something which is only relevant during, or mainly relevant during a crisis. Uh, that's essentially operational in character, uh, that it's largely about mitigating the downside, uh, downside risk, um, that it's primarily about costs rather than revenues, cost constraint, and that it's a property of functions or companies. We talk about the resilient company um, or the resilient supply chain. Uh, in fact, the data says that almost the opposite is, 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 tr is true. Uh, namely, that uh, the value of uh, dynamic capabilities is relevant across the entire economic cycle. Um, so um, two thirds of long-term outperformers across all industries um, outperform uh, during, uh, during a crisis and the value of their resilience accrues in the later stages, mainly accrues in the later stages of a crisis because it's more about differential growth than differential cost performance. Um, we find that, of course, resilience is, is operational. You need to recover critical supply chain functionality, but actually its main value uh, is, uh, is, is competitive. Um, uh, so uh, the, the Formula One racing driver, Ayrton Senna, uh, is, is right is right about business too when he says that if you want to overtake 14 cars, a rainy day is actually the best time to do so. Of course, presuming that you're a good driver. So we find that competitive spreads, the possibility of uh, displacing your competitors actually is more possible during a crisis rather than less. Um, we find that it's about differential growth. Um, so uh, action on costs is early, controllable, and important to mitigate the downside but actually the most resilient companies mainly win on, uh, on differential growth. Um, and also, um, we, we, uh, this sort of may be obvious conceptually, but at an operational level, it's not always obvious that we think that resilience is a property of whole systems, not of parts of systems. So if you think you're resilient, but your suppliers or your customers are not, uh, guess what, you are, you are not resilient. So it requires a, a systems uh, perspective. Um, so I, I don't have very much time today, but just to give you a, um, a, a flavor for some of the analysis. So this, is, uh, this shows the, if you divide um, periods uh, uh, within an industry between uh, volatile periods, and we just define volatile periods as ones there is where there is a 15% down draw uh, in market capitalization or more, and stable periods, and you look at the performance in terms of total shareholder returns between uh, non-crisis, stable periods, and crisis periods, um, you can see, I think, already two of the conclusions that I, uh, that I mentioned. Namely, one of them is that um, the main difference um, uh, between resilient and non-resilient companies is on the upside, uh, not the downside. So essentially, the competitive spread um, usually doubles during a crisis. And we've now got all of the data on the, the complete cycle of COVID. So that also happened uh, during, uh, during COVID. Um, and you can see that this is uh, 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 as much a competitive matter as, uh, as, as an operational matter. And the same is true not just of performance, but of ranking of companies. So companies are more likely to change their relative competitive positions uh, during uh, a, a crisis. Um, uh, in fact, um, that, that, is, uh, that is true objectively, but, but not widely appreciated, except by uh, resilient companies, systematically resilient companies. We find that 15% of companies are systematically resilient in that they are repeatedly resilient across uh, crises. Uh, those companies actually look at crises as opportunities. And the, the most extreme example of that actually is Berkshire Hathaway. And I, I didn't appreciate that until I looked at their numbers, but essentially over a long period of time, almost all of the supernormal returns of Berkshire Hathaway have come from um, crisis periods, and almost none of it has come from stable periods, uh, which explains why um, Warren Buffett uh, has, has said things like, um, be greedy when others are fearful and fearful when others are greedy, uh, namely, uh, exploit the fear and the introversion of your competitors during a period of, of distraction. Um, 
So this uh, draws on our work with um, uh, Simon Le Levin, who spoke earlier. Um, so why, what makes um, uh, companies uh, resilient? Um, well, at the level of practices, there are about 100 common practices that are, uh, that are employed by resilient companies. So it's, uh, we don't get a very clear picture if we look at the level of practices. Um, but if we look at the, the level of the principles which inform those practices, uh, we see a clear pattern, which actually interestingly applies to biological systems as much as it applies to business systems. And so roughly in the order of that, uh, the shape of that curve I showed you, uh, the first principle that we see um, in resilient companies is one of prudence, uh, namely um, not gearing up for the uh, best case scenario or the expected scenario, um, but uh, anticipating uh, the realistic worst, uh, worst case scenario. And so the set of practices we're talking about here is obviously um, scenario planning, intellectual preparation for the possibility of, um, but also uh, more behavioral preparation, uh, wargaming, uh, actually running the behaviors on the, uh, on the wetware of the organization uh, so that you have behavior, behavioral preparedness too. Um, so that's a little bit about anticipation. Um, and we could measure that during COVID by looking at uh, when was the first time um, that uh, the, the company talked to its investors about its strategy for the crisis? And we found that the answer for some companies was never. They never did. And the answer for, uh, for other companies it was uh, immediately and as an opportunity. So quite a difference there. Um, then we have um, redundancy. Um, and by the way, if you, uh, if you look at these, if you squint at these uh, titles, uh, these principles, these are all things that should horrify any classical CFO because they're all different forms of inefficiency. Um, redundancy, which is holding excess capacity or resources um, to, uh, to buffer shocks. And we find that there is a, a very important trade-off uh, between uh, efficiency and resilience that most companies don't uh, think about uh, uh, calibrating um, uh, very carefully, but, uh, uh, but, uh, but, a minority, uh, but a minority do. Um, uh, but there are clever ways of reducing the costs of, of, of insurance. Uh, for example, variable insurance. Uh, you can vary the buffer stocks according to the perceived risk of the, of the economy at the time. Or very clever ways, like, um, uh, for instance, when, uh, Toyota's, when one of Toyota's suppliers' um, factories burned down, and it was the only supplier of a, a component uh, called T-valves for four-wheel drive vehicles, uh, unbelievably, they were able to get production up, up and running again uh, in a week. And that's because they didn't, didn't have excess capacity, but they had collaborative protocols that enabled them to repurpose capacity, even of companies that were neither owned by Toyota nor the supplier whose factory burned down. So it's a sort of variable functional um, uh, redundancy. Um, then we have diversity, um, which is... Um, not investing in, in one, way of, uh, one way of doing things. Um, so uh, the cyber attack doesn't take down your entire system because you, uh, you, you, have, a, uh, you have a backup system. And um, during COVID, what we found was that the, the companies that outperformed generally outperformed because they, uh, they rapidly adjusted to a new pattern of demand. So for example, Airbnb, the hospitality company, noted that they, there was a shift uh, to um, socially distance uh, suburban or uh, rural locations and and quickly um, uh, quickly um, ramped up that component of its portfolio now the interesting thing is it didn't create rural and distance locations from scratch um, otherwise it would not have seen a signal it already had a diverse portfolio it had to increase the weight of those properties um, but it, it's what a biologist would call pre-adaptation it already had inefficient heterogeneous elements in its portfolio that it could get a signal from that this was an increasing pattern of demand and then uh, 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 ramp that up uh, to, to cope with the crisis. Um, modularity. Uh, modularity is about um, uh, a certain level of ineffectiveness in having loosely, uh, loosely connected modules of organization rather than such a tightly interconnected system that when one domino falls, the, 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 the firm falls. Uh, a negative example of that would be the insurance company AIG that was rescued during the great financial crisis where the financial and governance linkages between all of the subsidiaries were so tight uh, that the management literally watched the dominoes drop. Um, so a very tightly coupled uh, system. Um, then we have um, adaptiveness, um, which is easier said than done. Uh, the ability to uh, notice things that are going well, notice things that are 
not going well and to reallocate uh, resources and share that information at a, at a very rapid pace. So there's a handful of companies uh, like um, the Tata company, TCS, has an explicit system uh, of, uh, of, 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 of adaptive, uh, what it calls knowledge management. It regards its business as a portfolio of experiments. They sell basically IT implementation projects. And when something goes well, they increase the weight of that sort of uh, that, that, that implementation protocol. Um, the majority of companies still have a sort of an annual, uh, an annual planning logic rather than a, an adaptive uh, logic. Um, plus, um, if we're talking about human systems, and one of the other speakers mentioned this, uh, we have to bring in intentionality. Um, so, of course, the, the thing that humans can do, the biological, that, uh, not, that um, other biological systems can't do, or inanimate systems, is um, we can actually uh, imagine, uh, we can uh, think counterfactually, we can think about the possibility of new states of the world which don't exist but could exist and we, could, and we can bring them about. And that's very important in the latter stages of adaptation to a crisis. So that was a subject of a book I just wrote called The Imagination Machine, a uh, deliberately provocative title. Um, upset some people because uh, I think people uh, like to think that imag imagination is the last thing in the world that we can manage. Um, but if you think about it, um, we don't say, oh my God, consumer psychology, that's so complicated, we couldn't possibly say anything, or human resources or, or organization, we couldn't possibly say anything. Um, so the, the, the latest neuroscience and the empirical work of companies suggest that indeed we can have a playbook for uh, imagination. And um, a very brief summary would be that um, we think that uh, systematizing collective imagination um, is about getting six things right. Um, so the neuroscience is very clear that the reason why we change our mental models is that we encounter an anomaly. We, can't, we encounter a surprise, uh, which is the inspiration to change our view of how things work. And, and so that's very important because a company, a large company is a bit like a sphere. The, the greater the radius of the, of the sphere, the lower the, the, the ratio of the surface area to the, the volume. Large, large parts of a company are inward facing uh, the larger the larger a company gets and um, so overcoming those forces of introversion in order to maintain surprise is the first important component the second important component is counterfactual thinking um, counterfactual thinking is thinking about things that couldn't be the case uh, which could be the case but which are not the case and and thinking through the details elaborating the details of those possibilities and there are well-established techniques in this space for instance um, uh, breaking a mental model into a components and repermutating the components or applying a strict constraint in order to force new thinking or releasing a constraint in order to permit uh, new possibilities and the interesting thing is in our survey work we found that um, we couldn't find um, any education systems which routinely deal with educate people either at the, uh, the high school level or the primary school level or the undergraduate level um, in any country in the world. Um, kindergartens do it, but we don't educate people how to think this way, whereas imaginative companies uh, do. They have the techniques for counterfactual thinking. Um, There's what we call the collision, which is when we collide ideas with reality. And uh, uh, of course, we do that when we validate an idea, when we test an idea. Uh, but of course, most new innovations fail. So what's really going on here is by constantly colliding new ideas with reality, that we're actually creating new sparks, new new seductions, new surprises, uh, which drives the innovation process. Good example here is Lego. Lego has a motto of um, learning through play. And you might imagine that learning through play applies to its uh, children's toys, but it also actually applies to its uh, managerial paradigm. And at the end of every year, the, the chairman makes a point of uh, thanking everybody for, the th for doing the things that they were not asked to do. In other words, the expectation is that there'll be constant uh, uh, unauthorized decentralized activities um, which result in collisions with reality many failures but many learnings um, the fourth stage is the spread of ideas the modern corporation uh, looks uh, outside in like it's designed to prevent the spread of ideas um, it has its silos its special language its, uh, its tribal jealousies between uh, between departments um, it's uh, you know, hierarchical communication protocols. Um, but there are some companies, not many, there are some companies out there like the Japanese company Recruit, who are designed, their entire HR system is predicated on making ideas spread because if ideas don't spread, then they are not adopted and they don't evolve as they pass through different uh, types, of, uh, types of mind. 
Um, one of the interesting paradoxes of imagination is that if you're successful, you create an, uh, uh, an invisible, boring situation. Uh, if the idea of, uh, of imagination is to create a new reality, if that reality becomes pervasive, it becomes invisible. So we're not all sitting here marveling at our smartphones, they just, we just have smartphones. And um, so there's a stage of the imagination cycle where we need to uh, basically um, industrialize uh, uh, a subtle and a fragile idea um, and that those evolvable scripts, um, for instance, the script to replicate on the other side of the world, the most uh, productive retail format on earth, which is the Apple store, what do you tell people? If you gave them an encyclopedia of instructions, it would be ineffective. If you gave them a philosophical aphorism like love the consumer, it would also be ineffective. So um, how, what is the script which actually makes the, the new reality pervasive? And then um, probably the trickiest of all is the, um, is, is the uh, is becoming a prisoner of our own success. Um, so success in business in terms of being number one is actually not that rare. Being repeatedly uh, two, three, four, five times or being so for a hundred years is extremely rare. And uh, actually the founder of my company has uh, famously said, and I found this to be true, that um, in, in the vast majority of cases, uh, businesses become prisoners uh, of the assumptions which underlie their, their, their past success. Um, I'm out of time, so I'll just um, very briefly touch on something new I'm working on, which is, um, so one of the things that we have to change, if you, uh, if you believe 5% of what I'm saying is that um, we need to change the, the strategy process, the strategic planning process. And I think there are five unspoken assumptions of a, a, strategy, a, a strategy process um, that we can reverse with technology. So one of them is the idea of thinking, then acting. It sounds very reasonable, but actually we can have near simultaneity uh, of probing the market with phantom products, real products, uh, messages. We can actually think while doing. Um, uh, you'll hear the word fit a lot in corporations, um, fit with, with a market reality. Fit implies a unique way of approaching the market, it implies a lack of optionality. Uh, we can easily manage the, uh, the complexity of optionality with digital ecosystem platforms, so we don't need to talk about unique fit anymore. Um, we can talk about exploring while exploiting, so in marketing a key concept is the customer offering classically, uh, but actually an offering is, is unidirectional. Um, Modern ecosystems platforms permit us to learn every learn something every time we give something. So actually, we can make sure that we are exploring while exploiting, and even getting paid for helping the consumer with their exploration journey. Because explore exploit is not just a trade off for companies; it's a trade off for consumers too. Um, markets and segments. Markets and segments are fictions. It assumes a homogeneity of of, of needs. Um, uh, actually, we now have the technology to. Uh, to have mass customization, which in other words is getting paid for complexity, embracing and getting paid for complexity. And then of course the unit of analysis ceases to be the, uh, the enterprise and becomes the ecosystem if we conceive of uh, a business in, in this way. So uh, in summary, we need a more dynamic um, uh, approach to strategy for the more complicated circumstances we're in. I think we can learn a lot from biology about the principles of that. I think we know from the history of uh, crises in business, the practices that we need to do that. And I think we have some ideas about new ways of thinking about uh, strategy and leadership and communication to make that uh, an operational reality. So let me, let me stop there. Thank you.